Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first session of Ruining the Vibe, Resonance and Its Discontents, led by Cecile Malaspina. In this seminar, we will pick up a thread that emerged during a recent international conference, Ecouture, Ecrie, La Resonance, Entry, Music et, et Philosophy, et Leon, excuse me for not being able to pronounce this perfectly. Um, during this conference, philosophers, composers, musicians, museologists, and scientists discussed the concepts and phenomena related to the idea of resonance. This survey seminar will pick up on a thread that ran like a background noise through this event, the limits of idealized resonance. The positive connotations of the idea of resonance resound without difficulty. Notions of harmony, amplification, synergy, and coherence animate its metaphorical reach. Upon closer inspection, however, the idea of resonance trails a shadow. The measuring of acoustic resonance, for instance, typically blindsides divergent and localized resonance, or re reverberation, too hard to measure and deemed irrelevant. The ideal of resonance, too quickly synonymous with harmony, also casts its metaphorical shadow over the prospect of compulsive social cohesion, a political ideal of a phase locking analogous to the enslavement principle of synergetics in optical physics. As a simplistic ideal, finally, resonance may all too soon favor a state of denial about social and psychological dissonance degrading the idea of concerted action into the suppression of jarring voices. Even in the ra rarefied realm of philosophy, an ideal of axiomatic resonance may lead philosophers to overstate the formal coherence and reach of its postulates. This survey seminar will bring together leading and emerging voices from different fields, unseduced by a self-congratulatory fiction of harmonious intersubjectivity. How do these fields and their theorization foster the potentials of non-consonant jarring voices? How do theorists, artists, and curators nurture the divided subject of partial identifications open to constant flux, referring to Claire Bishop? What can philosophy learn from contemporary artists and curators that may countervail the anxious fallback on overstated ideals of axiomatic resonance? The objective of this survey seminar is to contextualize the ways in which the making and curating of art remain recalcitrant to the metaphorical simplification of resonance. And the guest speakers will include Martina Raponi, Miguel Prado, Sonia de Jaeger or Jagger, sorry, um, Inigo Wilkins, Alexandra Chevremont, Matt Tin, and Macis Solomos, and we were supposed to be joined by Harmo. Um, let me see if he is here. No, I don't think so. Um, Hartmo wrote that um, was unable to join us today. Um, so I will introduce Cecile, who is leading the seminar. Cecile Malaspina is the author of An Epistemology of Noise out on Bloomsbury in 2018 and principal translator of Gilbert Simon Jones on the mode of existence of technical objects with the collaboration of John Rigaud in University of Minnesota Press 2017. She's program director at the College International de Philosophy in Paris and visiting fellow at King's College London, hosted by the Departments of Digital Humanities and the Department of French in association with the Center of Art and Philosophy. She is a member of the editorial boards at the Presses de Paris Nature, Rue Descartes, and Angeliki Journal of the Theoretical Humanities, as well as being commissioning editor for the independent publisher Copy Press. She is currently guest editing for Nature, Humanities, and Social Scientists, Sciences Communications. Cecile Malaspina obtained her doctorate in epistemology, philosophy, and history of the sciences and technology from Paris 7 Denise Diderot and her master's in contemporary French philosophy and critical theory from the Center for Research in Modern European Philosophy in the UK. Before turning to philosophy, she trained as an artist, art historian, and curator 
Her main interest lies in the normativity of concepts, especially with regard to the aesthetic and ethical implications of conceptualizing contingency and uncertainty. So Cecile will be giving a talk on the contemporary resonance of Hakuba, and I'll pass it over to you, Cecile. Thank you very much, Paige, for the introduction and for reading flawlessly through this whole text. Um, I really appreciate it. And uh, just to say that I'm stepping in for Hartmut Rosa, who we were really excited to have as our as one of our main speakers or a keynote because he's written a very influential book called uh, Resonance and uh, also another book on acceleration and he's um, he's a major voice in uh, post Frankfurt School critical theory in Germany right now and I'm hoping very much that he's well uh, I'm not entirely sure what happened why why he couldn't be here with us today and I'm, I'm hoping that we can still get him involved either in the round table or, or to you know to add a session or, or to get him to speak to you so you're gonna to have to make do with me today I'm just kind of sorry about that and um, I obviously couldn't write a new talk uh, just for today um, at such short notice so I'm going to be reading a talk that I gave at a recent conference um, on uh, the metaphorical role of resonance in the critique of pure reason and connecting that with um, contemporary concerns. So the title of the talk is Contemporary Resonance, the Contemporary Resonance of Hecuba. So in this paper, I was interested in the idea of resonance as a metaphor for reason and more specifically um, about the suppression of noise in this metaphor. So one of the questions I'll be asking myself is, in what ways does the idea of noise disturb uh, the picture of reason as an orderly resonant propagation. How exactly do we picture reason as a propagating order in the world of experience? I will bring this metaphorical relation between resonance and noise to bear on Kant's allegory in the first preface to the critique of pure reason, where he compares metaphysics to the deposed Trojan queen, Queen Hecuba, whose lament culminates in her transformation into a raging bitch, an allegory whose implications are as profound as they seem absent from, from the vast majority of post-Kantian commentary. Kant's reference to Hecuba seems to have fallen indeed on deaf ears, perhaps because it is deemed to hold too little weight in the business of hard philosophical reasoning, but more likely because it is awkward We've failed to acknowledge Kant's reference to Hecuba properly, but we've instead emphatically endorsed the other master metaphor, the one that Kant introduces in his second preface to the Critique of Pure Reason, where he compares the critique itself to the Copernican revolution. Kant's reference to Hecuba in the first preface to the Critique of Pure Reason thus occupies a surprising blind spot, or you could say a deaf spot, and once you notice it, as Kant makes his case for the critique on the basis of his uh, central allegory, comparing the pre-critical state of metaphysics to the lament of Queen Hecuba, you notice how odd it is that this metaphor has never received more attention. Now, not much can be said about Hecuba as a metaphor for metaphysics without abusing the integrity of Kant's philosophical undertaking and without veering from philosophical argument to literary concerns. But what little can be said does not seem to have been said, unless I'm overlooking important commentaries on Kant's likening of metaphysics to the metamorphosis of this Queen Hecuba. It seems more likely that post-Kantian commentary has been deaf or mute about, deaf to it or mute about it, certainly when comparing this crucial metaphor to the afterlife of the Copernican revolution, in the philosophical imaginary. I limit myself here to foregrounding the peculiarity of Kant's reference to Hecuba's lament. My aim is not so much to reflect the Kantian project itself, but to use Hecuba as what seems to me an underexplored, underexplored point of entry into the interrogation from today's point of view of what went wrong with the Enlightenment. 
My contemporary point of reference here will be a work by the noise artist Rosacea or Laila Yenersi entitled, There is no time here, not anymore. The astonishing silence about Kant's likening of metaphysics to the Queen of Troy suggests that we have invested rational discourse with a simplistic mental image of resonance, one that renders us deaf and insensitive to the implications of Kant's literary verb and to the status of his evocation of Ovid's complex portrayal of Hecuba as a guarantor of an unspeakable truth. What is the status of this unspeakable truth for speculative reason or metaphysics? To be sure, the centrality of the Hecuba metaphor has to do with the tremendous sacrifice that Kant requires of philosophy. In his critique, so as to save the dignity of metaphysics, we could say that post-Kantian philosophy consists to a large extent in the contestation of this sacrifice. Sorry, I read, I read this all wrong, so it doesn't make sense. To be sure, the centrality of the Hecuba metaphor has to do with the tremendous sacrifice that Kant requires of philosophy in his critique, so as to save the dignity of metaphysics. We could say that post-Kantian philosophy consists to a large extent in the contestation of this sacrifice. A myriad of attempts have been made to recover the raison d'etre of metaphysics, namely the elusive sympathy between being in itself and being for us, between noumenon and phenomenon. In other words, it is hard to think of post-Kantian philosophy in a different light than that of attempting to overcome an intolerable loss without thereby falling into irrationality, dogmatism, or solipsistic skepticism. To probe what went wrong with the Enlightenment from today's perspective, which is one of ecocide, climate chaos, and injustice, climate injustice, we must sit with the unintended consequences of the critique and thereby dwell also on that which it represses. Hecuba's metamorphosis into a raging bitch, which foregrounds the collapse of language into noise, seems as good a place as any to rekindle this conversation in light of its renewed urgency. The efficacy of the, I'm going to describe the Hecuba metaphor in detail in a second. The efficacy of the Hecuba metaphor for metaphysics lies in the pithiness of the mental image that it provokes and in, in the affective orientation that it imprints on thought. It throws into relief the shaky relation between pure reason and aesthetics, insofar as the Hecuba metaphor relates speculatively to the question of being, while clearly operating in a register of aesthesis, or one could almost say of pure aesthesis or sense perception, insofar as Hecuba's lament culminates in the collapse of language. The aim of Kant's critique of pure reason was to spare metaphysics unnecessary perplexity, to spare it unnecessary errors, and therefore the ensuing attacks and humiliations that the uncritical use of reason may have provoked. Only thus can metaphysics be rescued from the state of destitution which Kant famously compares with Ovid's Hecuba in this famous but underexplored line. And I quote from the first preface to the Critique of Pure Reason, where Kant says, despised on all sides, metaphysics has become the matron, outcast and forsaken, and mourning like Hecuba. And, this, and then he says it in, in Latin, which I'll skip here. The, the, what, there's another bit, uh, graced by all, graced of all by race and birth, I am now cast out and powerless. So to this end, the critique must establish the objective validity of its concepts a priori, and to judge, as in a court of law, how much the understanding and reason can cognize free of all experience, so that the critique can confine metaphysics to nothing but the inventory of all that we possess through pure reason, ordered systematically, 
so that nothing can escape the perfect, unconditioned unity of this kind of cognition in its absolute isolation from experience or particular intuition. So that would be for, for Kant, the correct use of pure reason or metaphysics. Another striking metaphor comes to contrast the downfall of Troy, the metaphor of the house, which conveyed the idea of a closed system. Dwell in your own house, Kant says, and you will know how simple your possessions are. In this house, every part exists for the sake of all the others, as all the others exist for its sake, and no principle can be taken with certainty in one relation unless it has, or at the same time, been investigated in its thoroughgoing relation to the entire use of pure reason. This is how the use of speculative reason is bound for completion, such that we must say of it, nil atum reputans, si quid agendum. Sorry, I was gonna avoid Latin because I never learned it formally, so I'm not even sure I pronounced this right. That the, so in English, this would mean thinking nothing done if something more is to be done. And the correct quotation from which uh, Kant takes this expression is Caesar, headlong in everything, believing nothing done while something remained to be done, pressed forward fiercely. We can thus define Kant's requirement for the complete resonance of all of reason's a priori cognitions as a harmonic epistemology. Recalling the etymology of harmony in joinery as referring to what is joined up functionally in, con in contrast, for instance, with a random heap. Now in formal logic, in contemporary logic, the term resonance applies when each proposition is closely correlated with the propositions that follow it. Step by step, each proposition thereby enters into resonance with the others and no element can be modified without compromising the whole and without compromise, sorry, without compromising the whole. The philosopher of mathematics, Robert Blanchet, a contemporary philosopher of mathematics, thus describes the process of deductive thinking as propagating a, con a constrained structure. Step by step, he says, a tight network is formed where directly or indirectly all proposals or all propositions communicate and resonate together. Think of the deductive resonance of a mathematical theorem, for instance, which achieves a faithful correlation between each and all terms, such that nothing is left to chance and no ambiguity can arise. The coherence of such a system expresses a resonance, in other words, a synergetic redundancy in the logical chain, such that all ambiguity is evacuated. Such an ideal system could be defined by a pure resonance without noise. Kant, according to his, uh, according Sorry, I do not, the problem is I, I didn't reread this before today because I wasn't expecting to give a talk. So I'm kind of rediscovering uh, what I wrote. Kant, according to this, promises that the critique will construct a system of pure reason whose completeness will be guaranteed and whose certainty regarding all of its components will be transparent like an architectural plan. Kant's doctrine of the transcendental method as an art of systems, thus aims at a systematic unity that will restore metaphysics to its status as the queen of the sciences by transforming the mere aggregate of thoughts into a fully joined up resonant architectonics of reason. But there's a small problem. Philosophy does not benefit from the same degree of formality as axiomatic systems in formal logic nor from the irrefutable nature of mathematical proof. It is enough to recall what happened to Euclid's fifth postulate or parallel postulate, where the attempt to, yeah? Sorry, 
Okay. It's me, Rafael. Hello. Uh, we are having an issue with like the recording because like I can know uh, it's recording like focused only on your video. So I'm gonna have to ask you to actually like try to either either we try to troubleshoot your mic on the main device in which you have the video or to turn on the like the uh, the webcam on the device that you're using like for the voice because otherwise like it's okay. getting recording. Okay, I leave my laptop, so then I, I unfortunately won't see you anymore until I finished reading, and then um, and then I'll try and join back in with uh, from the computer, so I can see you when we have the conversation. Yeah. But that, do you think that would solve the problem? Yeah. Do you want to try your mic like in the in the computer, just to ah, see yeah. if we can perhaps make okay, it work? I, I, presume, I was probably too okay. pessimistic. Okay. Let's try. Yeah. Just to, just to, uh, yeah mute the other one. Uh, no, go on the go on the uh, like the options from the system, the audio settings, like on top of the microphone, and then uh, take out the automatic adjustment and also the suppression of background noise. Say something. Yeah, I can't feel you. Right now. What, what do I have to take out? That that was that was working, right? but uh, it, it had a huge echo. Can you say something again? Yeah, no, I can't hear you. Uh, let me go to the. It's okay. I don't. I just think my my computer has my the Zoom on my laptop has decided to cancel me. I'm as in its noise cancellation program. I kind of fall inside that, which I think is actually quite funny. So on my phone, my phone is not clued up yet. <laughs> hasn't figured out how to exclude me. Um, so I'll just continue like this. The only problem is while I talk, I'll only I see you, Rafael, but I don't see anyone else. It doesn't matter. I'll, I'll finish reading this. And then afterwards, when we discuss, I'll join up again uh, through the through the laptop. No, it's and from, when uh, I when I go home to the UK, I'll buy a new laptop. So we, and if I still have the problem with Zoom on the new laptop, I don't know what I've got. I'll yeah, no, I mean, I mean to turn on the camera on the on the phone because then we can see you, like, and then we don't need like. Ah, uh, yeah, the sorry, I didn't. I hadn't realized that I wasn't on the on the camera on this one. Is yeah. this okay? Can you can you turn it around just to like the to put the phone in the case? Okay. Let me see if it gets better. Yes, that's good. We can see you perfectly. And then you can continue from there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Apologies for, for this. We we've tried to fix this, but it, it's a complete mystery why my mic works for all the other applications, but not for Zoom and just on my laptop. We, we can't figure it out. Noise cancellation because of her book on noise. So we okay. have to make sure. Maybe that... it's because you're talking about resonance and it's discontent. It's so like enough. Phone and camera yeah. <laughs> and your computer is like, yeah, we'll show you this in the in the form as well. <laughs> I'll show you noise cancellation. On. Let's go. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to leave. Thank you very much. You have a nice class. Everybody, sorry for the interruption. Now it should be fine from now. Just make sure to stay on your phone and like stay in it like this. I'm just uh, trying to figure out. It's so dark in here. I can't really see what I'm reading. Cheers, guys. Bye bye. And make make sure uh, take care of the battery because like Zoom eats battery out of the phone. So bye bye, guys. All right, there's no light in this room and it's getting a bit dark here. Okay, so Kant, according to uh, Kant promises that the critique will construct a system of pure reason whose completeness will be guaranteed and whose certainty regarding all of its components will be transparent like an architectural plan. Um, Kant's doctrine of the transcendental method as an art of systems thus aims at a systematic unity, one that will restore metaphysics to its status as the queen of the sciences by transforming the mere aggregate of thoughts into a fully joined up and therefore resonant architectonics 
of reason. Okay, but there's this problem. Philosophy does not benefit from the same degree of formality as axiomatic systems in formal logic, the way that Blanchet described it, nor from the irrefutable nature of mathematical proof. It is enough to recall what happened to Euclid's fifth postulate or parallel postulate. For the attempt to prove what seemed irrefutable from an intuitive standpoint not only failed, but the attempts to prove it led to the discovery of non-Euclidean geometry. Now, if it is enough for one postulate to break open an axiomatic system and recast an entire field of knowledge that had seemed set in stone, then what are we to make of discursive philosophy, which knows only postulates and has no formal axioms and therefore no means to formal proof? Like the Cartesian method, and like Spinoza's more geometrical, or his, his geometrical or axiomatic method, Kant's critique explicitly adopts the ambition of founding the edifice of reason as if it could attain axiomatic resonance, as if it could guarantee the propagation, the resonant propagation of a structure of thought without noise, a propagation that would render intelligible space and time itself and all that it contains. The Kantian ambition was that of constituting a system whose flawless a priori or axiomatic resonance must express not only its internal coherence, but also a sympathetic resonance with an empirical reality that, was, that would be amenable to the correlationist capture. The 20th century French philosophy, French uh, epistemologist Gaston Bachelard provides a striking image of thought regarding Newtonian physics, so the epistemological paradigm within which Kant operated. And by this image, we can intuit all that is problematical about the Kantian zeal to bring the house of reason in order, to secure the use of reason from historical transitoriness and to freeze it in a quasi-eternal completion. We lived in Newton's world, says Bachelard, as in a light and airy dwelling. Newton's thought was, at first sight, a marvelously neat type of closed thought. One could leave it only by breaking out. So that's the famous Bachelard quote. Bachelard beseeched philosophers to return to the school benches, to break out of the intuitive clarity of the Newtonian system, so as to be able to advance in step with non-classical mechanics and non-Euclidean geometry. Despite the complexity of the modern scientific understanding of resonance, philosophy has nevertheless remained stuck with a pithy mental image of classical resonance, evoking the cosmic order and harmony of the spheres. The metaphorical power of resonance thus has a no noble history dating back as far as the Pythagoreans and its efficacy continues to this day to orient discourse about systems. Complex systems are likewise often represented as governed by information processes, which are equated with the complete evacuation of noise or entropy. Kant's comparison of the pre-critical state of metaphysics with the lament of Hecuba was in all likelihood intended to present the unsystematic use of reason as a noisy mess prior to its organization into a resonant system. But the Hecuba metaphor nevertheless acts, perhaps unwittingly, like a meteorite crash into this Pythagorean harmony of the spheres of reason and of the universe. Whether it was Kant's intention or not, and I suspect it wasn't, the introduction of this most harrowing of Ovid's metamorphoses at the molten core of the critique of pure reason, produces such a dramatic clash with the orderly conception of reason that it is almost unbelievable that not more attention has been paid to it. I therefore grant myself some poetic license under the cover of Kant's own invocation of Ovid to reflect on Hecuba's lament and on its failure to resonate overtly through Kant's critique 
and therefore on the post-Kantian failure to compose a relevant critique of the Enlightenment with consideration of this silenced lament in mind. Now, who is Hecuba to Kant and why should he cry for her? In the first version of the introduction to his critique, Kant calls metaphysics the queen of the sciences. Having been left unguarded in the war against dogma, dog, uh, dogmatism and skepticism, metaphysics is now like the Trojan queen Hecuba, presiding over a kingdom going up in flames. Just as Hecuba must see the destruction of Troy, so metaphysics has lost the realm of pure reason where it reigned supreme. We encounter Hecuba in the 30th canto of Dante's Inferno, which is a text that we discussed in our, uh, our last seminar on the Great Refusal. And this is what Dante has to say about it. I quote Dante here. And when fortune overturned the pride of the Trojans, who dared everything, so that both the king and his kingdom were destroyed, poor wretched captured Hecuba, after she saw her Polyxena dead, and found her Polydorus on the beach, was driven mad by sorrow and began barking like a dog. Now Kant could have referred directly to Homer's Iliad, to, to the mention of Hecuba in Homer's Iliad, to Euripides' Hecuba, or to Seneca's sexualized cliche of the mourning widow. His choice of referring to Ovid's metaphor metamorphosis instead seems by no means an obvious one. Given this non-trivial choice of Hecuba's metamorphosis as a metaphor for the critical transformation of metaphysics, we are compelled to ask of Kant why Ovid's Hecuba in particular so resonated with the raison d'etre of the critique of pure reason, which is the safeguarding of speculative reason. We may therefore redirect the question of Shakespeare's Hamlet, who ponders why or how the actor could be so moved by the recital of Hecuba's fate. So Hamlet famous, famously says, what is Hecuba to him or he to her that he should weep for her? What in other words can we infer from Kant's critical choice of Ovid's Hecuba as a metaphor designating the molten core of the critique of pure reason, that is the, the speculative reason, uh, use of reason or metaphysics? What can this choice tell us about the raison d'etre of Kant's critique, which will perform nothing less than a complete metamorphosis of the field of speculative reason? How are we to make sense of the transition from one critical metaphor to the other? From Hecuba's lament, culminating in Ovid's depiction of her metamorphosis into a raging bitch, to the Copernican revolution, whereby the object of experience is no longer the organizing principle at the center of reason, but is now displaced, orbiting around the centrality of the a priori use of reason, so as to recover and safeguard reason's natural possessions. Hecuba's lament as a metamorphosis may be dismissed as a mere liter literary trope, a sweetening of the bitter pill of philosophical critique or an introductory reason, uh, an introductory gesture of seduction towards the less rigorous reader of the critique, one that may be permissive of a certain fraying of the critique at its edges, where its higher intents brush against limited, the limited purview of the common intellectual. The metaphor of Hecuba's metamorphosis has been dismissed as far as I can tell, and certainly in contrast with the metaphor of the Copernican revolution. But surely it can do no harm to unpack this metaphor so at least so as at least to have a more appropriate intuition of what it is that we dismiss as mere noise from the formal concerns of the critique, which have retained the attention of commentary. When, Kant's favor, when Kant favors Ovid's Hecuba, whose lament culminates in her metamorphosis into a raging bitch, he chooses a metaphor, meta, uh, he chooses a metaphor for metaphysics that appears to carry more far-reaching implications than the famous line suggests when Kant refers directly only to her loss of status and power. This is when he says, a moment ago I was endowed with the greatest things and now I am exiled or destitute. 
to the, this is when he compares Hecuba to, to metaphysics as the queen of the sciences. Now, who was Hecuba? She was a Trojan queen, mother of 19 children, among them Paris and Cassandra. She presides over the fall of Troy in the death of all of her children. Ovid's depiction of Hecuba's lament begins with Hecuba pouring tears over the corpse of her daughter Polyxena after the latter has been sacrificed on the tomb of the Greek, Greek warrior Achilles. Achilles, who had first desired Polyxena's young brother, the Trojan prince Troilus, is said to have killed him before falling in love with Polyxena. Having revealed his weakness to Polyxena, Achilles is subsequently shot in the heel by Polyxena's other brother, Paris, in retribution for the murder of Troilus. Hecuba's lament thus begins with a famous scene, similarly recounted in all the other versions of the play, in which Hecuba pours hot tears over Polyxena's wounded corpse, covering Polyxena's lips with kisses, and mad with grief, Hecuba is shown as pulling out her white blood encrusted hair and beating her chest in despair, uttering the famous words that we also find in the critique of pure reason. So I quote here from Ovid's Metamorphosis. I was the greatest queen, a woman strong in my sons and daughters and my husband, and now an exile, poor, torn from the tombs of those I loved, I am dragged off a prize a slave woman to, to Penelope. Why must I linger here, Hecuba asks. Why prolong an old woman's life, cruel gods, unless it is for me to view more funerals? If Kant had not called onto Ovid to make the point of comparing metaphysics to Hecuba's lament, then the metaphor's resonance for metaphysics may well have ended here in a dramatization of dejection and destitution. However, the peculiarity of Ovid's account is that, it, that in it, Hecuba's lament is yet to culminate in an expression of grief that will nullify language. Just as Hecuba, explain, uh, just as Hecuba exclaims the famous line quoted by, by Kant, Ovid directs her gaze to the lifeless body of Polydorus, her last son, that she thought was still alive and who is washed up on the shore. Polydorus was until this moment, Hecuba's last child thought to be alive under the protection of an ally, the Thracian Poly Polymnestor. This is the moment that will separate Ovid's account of Hecuba from that of Homer, Euripides or the eroticized cliches in Seneca. And it must interpolate us when we consider the power of this metaphor stand, as standing for metaphysics, the queen of the sciences. Ovid's dramatization of Hecuba's lament at first appears to reach an apogee or climax of extreme intensity in this moment where her, her lament tarries and she raises her eyes to the sky in a stern silence that expresses grief beyond words. And I quote again from Ovid's Metamorphosis, the translation, her big swollen grief surpassed the power of utterance. She stood aghast, she had no speech, nor tears to give relief. Excess of woe suppressed the rising grief. Lifeless as a stone on earth, she fixed her eyes and then looked up to heaven with wild surprise. But what sets apart Ovid's account of Hecuba's lament is still not this point of utmost intensity where speech tarries. Silence here is but the tipping point. Hecuba's grief-stricken silence will mediate the intensity of grief and outrage and betrayal, inducing the process that will bring about Hecuba's metamorphosis. Hecuba realizes that, that her son was betrayed by the Thracian king Polymnestor and sets out to reach his inner circle. Hiding her grief so as to get close enough to the unsuspecting traitor, she lures him to a secluded place with a false promise of a treasure for her son Polydorus. As Polymnesta hastens to produce the treasure, he hastens her to produce the treasure, further insisting in his deceit that he would safeguard the treasure for her son, which she knows is dead. Hecuba catches hold of him in one of the most harrowing scenes in, this, in the history of literature. 
And I quote again from, uh, I quote fragments from, the, from Ovid. In the traitor's face, she bestowed her nails and scratched out his eyes. She thrust her fingers in as far as she could and did bore not his eyes, for why his eyes were pulled out before, but both the places of the eyes berayed with wicked blood. As the horrified Thracians throw stones at her, Hecuba opens her chap to speak, but instead of speech, she howls and barks as she undergoes the metamorphosis into a dog. The howling of, uh, the howling of Hecuba is long heard in the fields of Thrace and is said to have moved not only the Trojans, but also the Greeks and even the gods. It is no small paradox that the metaphor of Hecuba, which Kant links explicitly and for no obvious reason to Ovid's metamorphosis, has fallen entirely on deaf ears in post-Kantian philosophy, as far as I could tell. Ignored and silenced while occupying the position of chief metaphor for the very stakes of the critique of pure reason, Hecuba dramatizes Kant's motivation to write a profound injustice the injustice by which metaphysics, the speculative use of reason, had suffered the loss of its realm and, and its most precious possessions. All are moved by Hecuba's fate. The Greeks, the Thracians, the gods, even Kant. But no trace, no echo of this metaphor seems to persist in Kantian scholarship, at least as far as I could tell. Here instead it seems eclipsed by this strange just up, up, sorry, the strange just up, just juxtaposition, sorry, with the chief metaphor of the second preface, which is the Copernican revolution. But how is it possible that the legacy of Kant's critique has resulted in this utter silencing of Hecuba's primal cry of grief and the accusation of an unspeakable injustice? Hecuba, who resonated so powerfully in Shakespeare's Hamlet, when Hamlet compares his own irresolution in the face of injustice with an actor's emphatic rendering of Hecuba's torment. If evoking Hecuba's story could make the actor's face turn pale, make his eyes well up, make his voice break, what, asks Hamlet, would the story of Hecuba's fate provoke in one who is not merely moved by her fate, but who, like Hamlet, resonates with his own experience of loss and intolerable injustice. And I quote here from, from Hamlet when he says, what is Hecuba to him or he to her, that he should weep for her? What should he do had he the motive and that passion for that I had? He would drown the stage with tears and cleave the general ear, make mad the guilty and appall the free, confound the ignorant and amaze indeed the very faculties of the eyes and ears. In Hamlet or Hecuba, the eruption of time into play, Carl Schmidt dismisses Hamlet's question as referring merely to the artifice of the actor's tears. So in this, the absence of any account of Hecuba's fate is conspicuous for this book, Schmidt's book, for a book whose title carries her name in relation to her famous evocation in Hamlet. Schmidt singles out the artifice of the actor's empathy for Hecuba, but seem, it seems to me he dismisses the point of Hamlet's reaction. Is it mere artifice or is it Hecuba's fate and the resonance of an unspeakable injustice that caused the actor's face to turn pale and his voice to break? Is it merely the capacity to act that intrigues Hamlet? Or is it the enduring resonance of Hecuba's primal or animal cry provoking a deeper resonance with Hamlet's state of grief and grievance and perhaps envy for her desperate transition to act and to deface her enemy at the cost of losing her mind and her humanity? I would argue that Hecuba's dramatic silence at the sight of Polydorus foreshadows the paradox of what is both a universally relatable portrayal of grief and its absolutely singular and therefore conceptless and unspeakable manifestation, her metamorphosis. Hecuba's metamorphosis moved the Greeks and the gods. It moved the actor and it also moved Hamlet. That is, Hecuba moved Shakespeare and Shakespeare transmitted and further propagated this resonance through the resonance of Hamlet. 
Hecuba also resonates today with the speechless trauma of victims of war and economic injustice and ecological injustice. It resonates more than any newsfeed, academic analyses or narration with the defeat of narrative, with a failure of words and concepts, which only derealize the fateful intersection of profound grief and intolerable injustice. Hecuba's metamorphosis into a raging bitch, the forsaking of language, is a desperate last resort to preserve a vital truth from its neutralizing capture in language and concepts. Her metamorphosis is thus more than a mute metaphor for metaphysics, it is like a shockwave resonating across the centuries, finding its way not only into the critique of pure reason, but over and beyond her silence that meets the unspeakable horror of death of the death of her last child, it is the collapse of language in the service of a betrayed truth that constitutes the metamorphosis of the noblest queen into a raging bitch. So and here I'm going to try and make the connection with, with the work of, of this noise artist, Rosacea, uh, a commission that she did called, There is no time here, not anymore. So my contemporary point of reference for the resuscitation of the Hecuba metaphor is my first experience of power noise as performed by the artist Rosacea or Laila Yenersi in, in a piece that was commissioned by David Valraff for the Noise Existence Festival in 2019. This piece was entitled, There is no time here, not anymore. The commission, which has since been released as a record entitled Effia, uh, built up a visceral intensity, starting, um, starting from and drowning out this sentence, there is no time here, not anymore, um, famously uttered in the British 1980s TV show, Sapphire and Steel, and which had also inspired the ontology of Mark Fisher's analysis of contemporary capitalist society. My point in making this connection between Hecuba's lament and Rosacea's noise performance concerns the Kantian injunction that forbids reason's access to the noumenon or to being in itself, and instead confines the critical use of reason to the adequate representation of possible objects of experience. Now, what kind of an object of experience is Rosacea's performance of this commission? There is no time here, not anymore whose aim is not only to refuse the straitjacket of aesthetics as a self-referential experience confined to the artistic mediation of the beautiful, but whose intensity tugs at our a priori intuition of space and time. Rosacea's performance seemed to transform the traditional space, the traditional spatial schema according to which sound is ordinarily, ordinarily directed at an audience. Instead of the audience, Instead, the audience itself was transformed into an integral part of the space of resonance. My impression was that of that sorry, my impression was of acoustic columns of intensity traversing the space like rotating masses of energy, swirling tornadoes of frequencies, moving through the auditor's body, completely overwhelming the ears as organs of perception, and transforming the body in its entirety into a tympanic, um, tympanic membrane. The physical power of resonance brought about an acute awareness of the permeable boundaries of the body, of the relative nature of its internal space, which participated as an acoustic chamber, becoming an environment rather than merely uh, finding itself in one. Audible sound thus became but the peak of a more fundamental, all-encompassing dynamic of stratified collisions of frequencies and amplitudes opacities and transparencies. The metamorphosis, if one could speak of it thus, consisted in a transmutation of the concept of the, con sorry, in a transmutation of the concept space and everything and everyone in it into a resonant matter with varying degrees of opacity. But the performance did not stop at the end of the set. As my body and mind continued to reel from the physical vibrations and the emotional onslaught, I found myself spending a night in anguish and horror, as if having witnessed a traumatic event. I felt myself compelled to ask, 
What was this performance to me so that I should weep for it? What was the rationale for the harrowing emotional inten intensity of Rosacea's commission? There is no time here, not anymore. This commission, it turned out, dealt thematically with the horror of the abductions of Yazidi women by ISIS in Iraq, beginning in 2014. Rosacea's performance also processed, with the, um, also processed the added violence that consists in the neutralizing effect of language when it transforms the real horror of what happened into an anesthetizing newsfeed. Rosacea's commission thus mobilized noise, it seemed to me, to tackle the paradoxical nature of communication to subvert the anesthetizing and derealizing effect of discourse, which turns experience into an object of cognition that does so by sacrificing the reality of grief. In an interview, Rizasia said, I used to write a lot, but at some point I realized that there are certain things spoken language cannot reveal. When I started making noise, I felt like a, like a great relief as if I had found an escape valve for the atrocious, merciless valve a world we live in. Also, it sometimes feels to me like the only possible reaction to political events, such as the structural extermination of Yazidi women by the so-called IS, which I have been intensely engaged with in the context of impending genocide of Yazidi population. Making noise as a form of resilience or cathartic moment, I don't know how exactly, but making noise often triggers a lot in me, and sometimes it makes me feel worse or better, but it feels good. So this is the end of, of quote from an interview with Rosacea. In contrast with the media representation of the brutalization of Yazidi girls and women, Rosacea's performance left me truly speechless. It transmitted a shapeless sense of grief revulsion and rage, first against the performance itself, which I experienced as an emotional intrusion, but then also in response to an obscurely conveyed truth that could not be verbalized. I would even say that it expressed grief as something as universal as a geometric shape, but without allowing language to purge its singularity. If the words assigned to the real but traumatic events are co-opted by digestible narratives in a way that makes the events somehow unreal, that sanitizes experience or even anesthetizes us, the noise appears to become a temporary site for the manifestation of a truth that cannot be spoken without being obliterated. Rosacea's performance of There Is No Time Here, Not Anymore had the effect of a partial realization of trauma, at least on me, issuing in the uncompromising attempt at its cathartic release, one that disrupted the neutralizing and distancing effect of language, if not the dissociation involved in the categorization of the understanding. Noise in this performance by Rizasia thus presented itself as one way to problematize an issue whose traction goes beyond the notoriously anesthetizing and derealizing effects of commercial news feeds. It lends itself to an investigation into the critique of the enlightenment. If we take this to involve what Adorno and Horkheimer singled out as rationality's in his in, sorry, inexorable drive to subsume particularity under universality, heterogeneity under homogeneity, and multiplicity under unity. This is an, an expression I'm taking from um, from Nihil Unbound, from Ray Brassier's Nihil Unbound, when he comments on Adorno and Hokamu. Noise, contingency, uncertainty, ambiguity, and dissonance come to subvert and enrich the simplistic philosophical metaphor of resonance. It revives the peculiar muted philosophical resonance of Kant's famous Hecuba metaphor, when he compares the pre-critical state of metaphysics to a lament that culminates in her metamorphosis. This noise, at least in the context of this particular performance of Rosacea's performance, had to be as extreme as of its depiction of Hecuba's metamorphosis if it was to break through the discourse barrier and suspend the dissociation of understanding and experience. Noise thus performed 
at the outer edge of artistic experimentation seemed to me to revive the ever renewed effort to disrupt the narratives and representations that protect us from reality in the very movement that they aim to represent and therefore distance reality. The performance of noise is extreme in the case of Rosacea because of the equ equally extreme power of denial and dissociation that produces the paradoxical effect of anesthetizing when appearing to present us with intolerable events and because so much is at stake. What is at stake, I would argue, is intimately related to the question of speculative metaphysics and to the sacrifice that the critique demands, namely the loss of reality, a reality that we must always recover by breaking through the forms of denial of our time and the lurch towards denial that inheres in philosophy as leaning towards intolerant rather than formal abstractions. Ah, oh, sorry, just a sec. What is at stake here, philosophically speaking? It is undeniably true, as Kant says, that the unconditioned cannot be thought without a contradiction. The unconditioned cannot be thought without contradiction. However, Hecuba's metamorphosis as a powerful metaphor for metaphysics also points us in the direction where the unconditioned or the noumenon or being in itself may present itself as a traumatic experience whose affective resonance dislodges the a priori intuitions of space and time. Differently put, the noumenon may not present itself as an object of experience ready-made according to the a priori cognitions of the understanding, but being and its correlate, loss, may nevertheless impose themselves not as an object of cognition, but as a problem for thought. A problem for thought without which metaphysics loses its raison d'etre. Noise cannot, of course, recover the noumenon the reality in itself any more than philosophical discourse can, but it can mobilize an intensity that may threaten to break down discursive forms of denial, including the voraciousness of formal subsumption that Adorno and Horkheimer berated in, rational, in rationality's inexorable drive, and I repeat here again this, this formulation, which I find very striking, rationality's inexorable drive to subsume particularity under universality, heterogeneity under homogeneity, and multiplicity under unity. What is at stake is thus a form of thinking capable of engaging both singularity and universality. This, however, also requires an updating of the master metaphor of reason, namely of resonance, so that it will go beyond the cliche of a harmonious order. We need an updated metaphor of resonance capable of recovering the reality, if not as an object of cognition, then as a problem for thought. I'll conclude with some reflection, reflections on why it matters when philosophers reduce the concept of resonance to a flat metaphor, such that resonance and noise appear mutually exclusive. As a philosophical metaphor, resonance evokes order, if not harmony, while noise suggests disorder and even chaos. Yet an explosion, for instance, while producing a deafening noise, nevertheless resonates both physically and psychologically. It projects what was won into a pulverized chaos, but its propagation waves still resonate. They resonate at subsonic frequencies in the case of a blast, and as supersonic frequencies in the case of detonations. Potentially traumatic and devastating, an explosion can thus nevertheless be a phenomenon that prop propagates through space and time and that may even resonate through generations and across the global media. Despite its real and empirical complexity, resonance nevertheless lends itself as a metaphor that is reduced to an evocation of harmony which would ideally express the agreement of reason with experience. Thus to say that something is true, in German, you could say es stimmt. That is to say a statement is tuned to reality, it resonates in a harmonic way with it. 
a philosophical or scientific statement is seen as being in tune with the facts. A well-argued thesis resonates harmoniously, übereinstimmen, whereas disagreement is always disharmonious. Resonance is seen as productive of an ontological and epistemological order, which aesthetics would then endorse through the judgment of the beautiful and moral philosophy through the judgment of the good. The notion of resonance thus serves as a master metaphor for, for philosophy, signifying the power of reason, the power of its irresistible conquest of the confused world of phenomena and affects. Noise, on the contrary, is what makes it difficult to test theories, as the economist Fisher Black uh, remarked in 18, 1986. Noise is what clouds our vision and forces us, in his words, to act largely in the dark. Noise, he says, is the arbitrary element in any equilibrium model. As a result of noise, we can no longer, strictly speaking, call it a rational model, he says, because noise creates uncertainty about variables of supply, demand, and price in economic theory in such a way that the future can no longer be said to be driven by rational expectations. Perhaps, he says, and most importantly, and this is what I want to draw your attention to, Perhaps, he says, research will be seen as a process leading to reliable and relevant conclusions only very rarely because, he says, noise creeps in at every step. Noise thus conceived poses a challenge to the accord between the intelligible and the sensible, between what the Greeks called noeta and aesteta, a challenge that mathematicians like Benoit Mendelbrot or René Tom have since answered with complex fractal geometry and with catastrophe theory. And that has animated the study of complex dynamical systems, not least the study of synergetics in complex self-organizing systems, founded on the groundbreaking research of the physicist Hermann Haken, who studied the phenomenon of resonance in terms of its enslavement principle in laser beams, so enslavement or phase locking principle. So, Science, contrary to philosophy, has thus long since incorporated noise, has become capable of statistical uncertainty, capable of saying perhaps, probably, and even of considering the rational singularity of catastrophic events that occur outside the stable system of, of probability. The 19th and 20th century sciences have shown the statistical noise and even the axiomatically undecidable are not the swan song of scientific reason. If anything, the integration of noise into physics and non-classical mechanics has led to an acceleration in scientific and technological advances. But with noise, the enlightenment metaphor of resonance reaches the end of its tether. It reaches a degree zero where both noeta and ice data, intelligibles and sense data, struggle to sit quiet in the Newtonian framework of order and irregularity. Noise, both scientific and artistic, also rattles the Kantian aesthetic regime, where we now struggle to see as if it were the product of intelligent, intelligent design, as if its empirical laws were designed to be understood by us. The notion of noise, and I'm nearly, nearly finished now, just a couple, couple of pages more. The notion of noise still has hardly any conceptual status in philosophy at all, and has only recently gained currency as a metaphor, more often than not as, a, as, uh, as an out, sorry. The notion of noise still has hardly any conceptual status in philosophy at all, and has only recently gained currency as a metaphor. Um, more often than not, Ah, yeah, more often than, as, than not as flat as the outdated metaphor of resonance whose opposite noise evokes. Noise evokes an idea of acoustic disturbance, interference in communication processes, and more generally, as a metaphor for the confused state of contemporary society, where the saturation of communication technologies and digital processes only add to a generalized sense of confusion that we attempt to tackle with big data and predictive algorithms. It seems to me then that the noise metaphor, stuck as it is in this minor role of being the mere opposite of resonance or the lack of information, 
nevertheless plays an underestimated role in the history of philosophy generally, and that it plays a particularly dramatic role in the critique of pure reason. My own obsession has to do with the aporia, the astonishment that we must all feel at the unintended consequences of the enlightenment. For we now have the scientific, technological and political means to solve most material challenges we currently face, but we seem defenseless against human folly. We can split atoms, but we cannot get over medieval attitudes to bodies because they're female, because they're trans, because they're not white or because they're not human. This is the paradox that obsesses me, the simultaneity of utmost techno-scientific accomplishment and the patent psychosocial dysfunction. What does this paradox say about philosophy's core engine, its rationality and its ethics? If indeed, as I believe, rationality is worth hanging on to as a matrix for boundless cooperation and as a bulwark against prejudice and irrationality, then what are we getting wrong about it? How can we make sense of rationality if the Enlightenment's obsession with the destruction of superstition leads to an obsessive compulsive reinstating of myth, as Adorno and Horkheimer argued, that is, if rationality's sacrifice of myth unwittingly entrenches mythic sacrifice more deeply in the Enlightenment's rationale. What are we sacrificing at the altar of reason, whereby reason becomes folly? Kant's critique laid the ground not only for an anesthetized use of pure reason, but also for an infantilized theory of experience, which we now call aesthetics. The subsequent history of aesthetics, variously defined as a critique of taste, as philosophy of beauty or of art, if not as a science of art, is not a science, but needs to be chaperoned by other sciences like art history, sociology, psychology, or ethnology. Not surprisingly, aesthetics retains a somewhat degrading feminized status of recreation in contrast to epistemology, something the mind turns to when the day's labor of the scientist or engineer is over. The idea of aesthetics as irrational or as the other of rationality seems only to infantilize aesthetics further. When what we truly need, as Whitehead beseeched us, is to heal the bifurcation of nature, whereby science voided itself of the dimension of value. With a dissociation between the understanding and aesthetics in place, philosophy is in no good shape to leverage loss, the loss of reality that numbs us collectively to the events unfolding around us. So with the dissociation, i just read that again, I think, I think I didn't read it well. With the dissociation between the understanding and aesthetics in place, Philosophy is in no good shape to leverage the loss of reality that numbs us collectively to the events unfolding around us. The erasure of Hecuba from the legacy of, of the critique should resonate with historical moments where trauma leaves us speechless and at least temporarily delegitimizes both rational and aesthetic discourse. Hiroshima, the Shoah, ecocide, climate chaos and you could go on. We cannot tackle the problems we have created without science and technology. And the question I ask myself, to which the answer must include a genuine grappling with both the concept and metaphor of resonance and noise is the following. Is there a way of pursuing the enlightenment ideal of the emancipation of reason from prejudice and superstition without succumbing to the apparent folly of what Ray Brassier summarizes with reference to Adorno and Horkheimer, and I repeat this again because I find it so important, reasons inexorable drive to conceptual subsumption, that is, its drive to subordinate particularity to universality, heterogeneity to homogeneity, and multiplicity to unity. Without, in other words, rendering everything equivalent to everything else, but precisely in such a way that nothing can ever be identical to itself. Gaston, ba Gaston Bachelard provided this striking image of thought that we have to extend to Kant's architectonical reason, whereby the apex of clarity and coherence may be indicative of a frame of mind that is closed to the change that is afoot. We lived in Newton's world, he said, as in a light and airy dwelling, 
Newton's thought was at first sight a marvelously neat type of closed thought. One could leave it only by breaking out. It is this idealized form of luminous resonance that makes us unable to discern not only the unspeakable grief and injustice that it contains, but also the noise that announces the impending need to recast the entire system of thought. It is in this sense that the notion of noise may be required to act retrospectively as a vocable rather than a specific concept, and perhaps Hecuba as its metaphorical porta voce. Thank you. I'm sorry for the for not uh, very well prepared reading. Shall we I take a break? Yeah, so I will take a break and I'll try and join join back up with the other. Um, ah, but mind you, that's going to be a problem for recording, right? Oh, no, we'll just keep the recording going during the break. Okay, but you know what, I'll try and uh, join as I know as an auditor, then I can't see everyone, right? Anyway, I'll try, I'll try it. I hope, hope it will work. I'll try and join, join the Zoom so I can see everyone on the screen. Ah, okay, I see. Yeah, yeah, we can do that while, um, yeah, while we're taking a break. What What is a good amount of time, like five or 10 minutes or? I would say 10, 10, 15 minutes is good. Okay. How much time do we have after this? We still have an, an hour, I think, no? Yeah, we have an hour and 15 minutes left. Why don't, why don't we say 10, 10 minutes, maybe in, at 25, we meet again at 25? Mm -hmm. Is that yeah. good? Sounds good. Okay. See you in a bit.
Hey, Cecile. Um, if you want to see if you could keep your camera and microphone from your cell phone, and then you could see all of the attendees from your computer screen, would that work for you to be in discussion? You're on mute right now if you're talking to me. <laughs> Sorry, because I've got the two screens. Yeah, yes. the, the little one where I see you. And I've, I've done that already. I've logged on to the computer mm -hmm. and um, turned off the sound and the mic from the computer. Wait, I get it now. Yeah, one camera is off. So you've got my mic only through the phone and everything else through the computer. Does that work? Um, yeah, I think if you turn on your camera from your phone, though, so that it could be that could be better ah of course because that's that's where the problem with the recording <laughs> ah oh yeah. my god oh yeah, this <laughs> this is really you creepy. Turn, if you want you could turn off your camera from your <laughs> computer you can better. watch everyone on your computer and we can watch you from your phone i oh, know i didn't calculate that that's not my good side i think i look better from the other side <laughs> <laughs> like i mean i guess you could move um, no i'm, I'm joking <laughs> I, I haven't figured out I this uh, side great. from which i look good yet <laughs> um okay that's perfect and then um also in the chat um some folks were asking if you'd share this paper as well that you read from yeah i will very soon i'm um translating it to french and and compacting it a little and tidying it up and and then i'm going to um it's going to be published soon hopefully if it you know it'll be reviewed and and if it gets published then i can translate the um or share the english version of it great okay great and then also if you could type the name of the no, um noise artist in the chat that you yeah. mentioned So why is this? It's not the question answer, right? I just need to check the mm -hmm. chat. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to put a, a link as well. Wait, so this doesn't really work very well, but. What did I do? Huh? It's okay, sorry. I just spilled a glass of water, but there's no, no cables. Ah, I'm trying to figure out the, the different screens here. Okay, I'll find link for Rosacea. So you can't really find her if you type rosacea, you'll see just pages upon pages on, on a skin disease that has the same name. It's not a good artist to Google. Oh, amazing. Thanks, Gregory. Yeah, brilliant. Okie dokie. Well, how do I get back to you guys? Here we are. Okay, do you want to start maybe some, we wanted to do introductions, right? Yeah, we can do introductions. Also, Cecile, if you want, you could move your phone camera to be a little bit more centered. It might be. Um... I know, but then then I've got you. <laughs> it's like this. No, mind you. Oh, like this one. Oh, yeah, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> you don't, you don't want to know the installation. I've got the phone on on two glasses against the bottle if you put it in front of it. Sounds okay, but it works. Cool. So. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, so we can go, I can just read off the order of the list that I have the panelists. And I mean, everyone can just introduce themselves and I guess their interest or relation to the theme, unless you have any other question you'd like to. Do we have like, I can't see how many people are, it's 18, right? So we don't, uh, there are maybe if everyone 15. takes like 30 seconds, a minute, just to say mm -hmm. your name and uh, some of you I know already, but uh, if there's new people in the seminar, it might be good just to say a couple of words, your name, what your area of research or interest is, 
so that, that we have a bit of a sense of cohesion and group. And I wanted to reiterate also something that Christine emphasized very strongly in the last seminar that, and that I want to carry forward, which is the idea that, that this is really an, a seminar where everyone is supposed to feel free to participate and, and speak and that we want to you know, look after the quiet ones, especially that everyone feels that they can bring themselves in. Yeah, so shall we just go in, in the order of, of, I don't know, maybe we don't all have the same order of people on the screen. Yeah, I'll just call out names in the order that I can see. Have have been been Brett, great. Yeah, um, so why don't we start with Alexander? Yes, okay, hello. Hello, Cécile. Ah, bonjour, Alexandre. Comment ça va? Très bien, merci. Je suis <laughs> ravie que tu sois là. I'm oui, really uh, happy that you're here. Merci beaucoup uh, pour tes communications. Uh, I will speak in English. It's uh, that better for other people. Uh, thank you for your communication. Uh, for so, so rich and uh, interesting. Uh, so I will present myself. Uh, I am uh, Alexandre Chevremont. Uh, I will speak um, uh, on the August uh, 20th uh, about uh, the notion of resounding uh, by Eugène Minkowski and uh, discuss the uh, doctrine of uh, Hartmut Rosa resonance. I thought that uh, Hartmut Rosa would uh, speak today, but uh, okay, I, I was happy to listen to you. Uh, so that's my presentation. I, uh, I am working about, uh, um, uh, can say some studies, but <laughs> uh, that's a, a very specific approach. Uh, I uh, I work uh, about the, the link uh, between music and architecture. Peculiar. So. <laughs> Merci. I was so happy that you could come and join in today, and, and I'm very sorry to have to stand in for someone as important as Hartmut Rosa. <laughs> I will I will continue to try and get in touch with him. I just hope that he's okay, and that hopefully he can perhaps we can slot him in at a later stage. <laughs> okay. I'm glad. I'm glad I didn't see that you were there uh, here before I, I started reading the paper because I would have been much more nervous. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. And there's another Alexander as well. So another person wants to present uh, himself. Yes. Yeah, Alexandra Damaskino, um, if you want to go next. Lejeanne, do you can you hear us? It's coming. Okay, well maybe we will come back. <laughs> um, let's go to Benito. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay, I'm Benito. I have a I live in Naples, Italy. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in uh, philosophy in La Sapienza University of Rome, um, and my research interests uh, are actually still very broad. I don't I don't have a a particular um, field of interest, uh, but much of um, like the intersection between ethics, aesthetics, and uh, political philosophy. So that's it. Thank you. Um, Eduardo. Hi everyone, my name is Eduardo. I live currently in Sao Paulo. Um, I am at my master's right now here. Uh, I research and uh, trying to make a systematic approach to memes and coming from philosophy of the mind, aesthetics, and uh, like ideology, political theory. And I'm very interested in how these metaphors or images which are approximated to sound can be taught in philosophical terms. I read a little bit of the epistemology of noise by Cecile because of my team. And then I got very interested in how this, on this sort of approach. 
Thank you. Gregory? I assume that's me. I'm Gregory Van Wagner and I have degrees in philosophy, physics, and math. And I teach right now in the American state of Oregon. And I'm just here. I guess this this whole uh, continental philosophy stuff is filling a lacuna in my understanding. And that's it, unless you have a question. Jeanette? Hey, um, I'm Jeanette. Uh, I'm a noise musician and a writer. Um, and I'm interested in, like I studied design um, and I'm interested in aesthetics and political theory and how that um, is applied in art. Thanks. Maria? Hi, can you hear me? I think you can. It's just cutting out a little bit, but we can hear you. Oh, I can try like uh, rerouting my audio just, just a sec. Oh, no, it, actually, it's good now. Okay. Uh, thanks. So, um, Maria Jesus, uh, I was, yes, in, in the past seminar also at the Project Fusel, and I have a bachelor's degree in music composition. And um, my interest in the seminar is, uh, and I've said that in, in the past one, is absolutely about resonance and about re resonance is a um, foundation for relation in which I've integrated some things around Simondon and, and Whitehead, which have been very, very useful actually. So I'm <clears throat> basically, quote unquote, on resonance with this uh, specific topic. And uh, I would say my work also focuses on that on relations and at different scales and at different um, modalities, immersive spaces and immersive installations, something that I'm very interested in. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. Um, Misty Slav, if I said that correctly. Yes. That's correct. Uh, hello, my name is Mr. Slav. I'm originally from Kyiv, Ukraine. I reside in Funchal, Madeira. Uh, I'm a PhD in philosophy, uh, lecturer in Kyiv Polytechnic University, um, part time from now, from now on. And um, my uh, main uh, research interests are the intersection of metaphysics of time with metaphysical pessimism, but also uh, in, um, in other. Um, Research interest is uh, the conceptual framework of uh, social cognition or social philosophy of the early Marx and uh, um, Deleuze and Guattari. And um, several years ago, I also have come to the idea of resonance as cognitive metaphor um, in, uh, in nexus with uh, the concepts of uh, attenuation and self oscillation which I derived from uh, my hobby, the analog synthesizers, where resonance is one of the two crucial parameter, parameters for um, the synthesizer filters. So uh, I suppose this uh, seminar would give me more, um, more food for uh, feeding out the cognitive framework monster that I'm working for. Uh, Patrick? Hello. Um, my name is Patrick. I'm here in Pennsylvania in the United States. And um, I'm a musician, a composer. I went to Manhattan School of Music and do a lot of playing piano and electronic stuff. And been interested these days, I guess, in like theories of fascism how they're enacted in our like day-to-day -day lives and how how sound relates to that i guess and that's it thank you looking forward to it thanks um, igor hi everyone can you guys hear me yes okay uh, hi i'm igor um i have a licentiate degree in visual arts 
I just graduated, and I I'm interested in how this uh, how these sound concepts and these terms have relates to the 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 visual arts area, because I think that there is some kind of <laughs> resonance, <laughs> not 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 so directly, but how this how not, not also not so much metaphorically, but uh, but I I think these concepts has a uh, I don't know a polit a political sense that has so much to be explored in the visual arts as a as a kind of a frame not only of a con conceptually but also how how it acts directly in the world. So yes, thank you. Thanks, Sonia. Hello. Uh, I want to say, first of all, thank you so much, Cecil, for the paper, because it was amazing, and I can't wait to read it also. I took a lot of notes, but I really would like to, as soon as it's published, let me know, and then, yeah. Um, I'm Sonia. I will be uh, presenting together with Inigo in a few weeks, on the 13th of August, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And um, I uh, work in philosophy, I'm doing a PhD, um, philosophy of artificial intelligence, and I, I'm interested in the concepts of interest, uh, pointing, and uh, metaphors very much as well, uh, analogical reasoning, and uh, a lot of other things. But uh, I'll leave more for, for the 13th to talk about this stuff. Thank you. And I think that's everyone if alexandra is not is i'm not sure if you're there or not or if i missed anyone i think you missed me uh oh, sorry. Me. Oh, oh, i apologize <laughs> <laughs> hi how are you well uh, i was already in the past seminar and i guess i i know most of my classmates so i just want to say that uh, in this aspect uh, well, I'm a visual artist, and I, I, but what happens also is that, or what it's of big interest to, to me is that I like sound art and the relation between visual arts and sonic, you know, sound art. Uh, so, um, also, I think there's like, a, um, how do you say, like, um, these connections. Uh, in avant-garde movements and also in Latin American uh, contemporary art and La Latin American conceptual art from the 60s, 70s, that is also mediated by a sound in some of, this pra of its practices, sometimes experimental and sometimes uh, as part of their, uh, let's say, agenda or their uh, uh, exercises. I, it's what I like the most about sound art. And I guess I just need to provide myself of lectures and understand phenomena. That's all. Yeah. Thank you. And I think I didn't miss anyone else, I hope. Um, in which case I'm Paige. I am currently in Berlin, but usually in Los Angeles. And I'm an artist mostly working with installation and sound and um, interested in ecology and the ecological body and um, more like embodied forms of communication and attunement. So yeah, uh, thanks everyone. Amazing. Well, thank you so much everyone for introducing yourselves and I'm so happy to see many of the faces from, from the last seminar again and to meet, meet new people and, and as I listen to each of you introduce yourself and some of you introducing yourselves again, I was uh, thinking that actually I would like uh, to ask you, each of you to send us links for texts that you think uh, that spring to your mind, that you think are relevant or that are important critical uh, references for you. Because I think we, we have a much stronger syllabus if we include the texts that your, your entire experience brings to this. So if you have the PDFs, even better. I won't ask where they come from if you don't ask me where mine come from. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that'd be amazing if you, if you could. There's no obligation, obviously, but I, I think even as we progress through the conversations, if there's links 
to other, you know, other writers or artists as well, uh, please do, do send them and then we'll make a super rich syllabus that, that we can then use, transpose to other seminars as well, or make it turn into a kind of bigger reference. That would be amazing. Including this, obviously your own work, if you're happy to share it, if it's already published. I was told in, in the beginning of this, we, we're not sharing unpublished material, just to be on the safe side, that there's no misunderstandings or anything. But um, yeah, if you, if you could, that would be amazing. Yes, I don't know what uh, JLIAT's work on noise is, um, ah, but okay. I think I also, it's Jad, it's a noise performer who also has PhD in philosophy and mixes speculative realism uh, with uh, noise performance. Ah, very nice. Yes, absolutely. Please also do send links in any language that you have available. I mean, if it's, if it's not available in English, it doesn't matter because, I mean, it's probably the biggest common denominator that we have, but as far as I could tell these people, if you brought together all the ling languages of people involved in this seminar, um, it'd be good to, uh, to have also recourse to stuff that's as yet un untranslated. He's from UK, so it's English. I, I, to be honest, I never, I don't know him. He's underground. <laughs> Yay. Do you know which city he's based in? Uh, oh, I don't know. Exactly. But maybe if he's in London, maybe I'll, I'll go and catch him somewhere. I will send a link in a chat. Cool, but I, anyway, um, I guess what's the best way to, to send this? If you send this to Paige and me, not just this session, but in, in future of this sessions, conversations coming up, you think this could be relevant, including your own work if you have performances or anything like that just check it check it in there we'll have a big cauldron and make a magic potion out of it do you want to um do you want to have a, a discussion a little bit i know it's i was thinking that perhaps having a break after the talk uh, will make it a little bit harder to jump um, back in as i was rereading this it was a lot less clear to me than the first time when i read it when i when i wrote it it, it made more sense to me than now so I don't know, I hope it still made a little bit of sense to you, but it wasn't a very um, orderly exposition of ideas. So I'm gonna have to do some work still before I submit this to Alexandre. But whether, do you wanna come back to, to the, the talk or do you wanna discuss resonance more generally? We still have a little bit of time and there's no, not, no student presentations yet. I guess I, maybe I have a question and maybe it's a place to move from the talk and incorporate it is like uh, to maybe speak a little bit more on how exactly like the sounds Hecuba makes or, or, or then how like the sort of what you got to at the end in terms of like noise is like how it breaks down frameworks like what exa how exactly maybe you think about like the the maybe like more like literal like sonic aspects of these things in terms of actual sound yeah because there's a kind of sliding isn't there from the metaphor um and the metamorphosis as a metaphor to then comparing to kind of linking this up with the with the sound work that Rosasia did mm. I think one, one of the thoughts I had in the back of my mind for a long time in, uh, in a kind of slow, quiet conversation with some of the questions that were raised by speculative uh, realism was this idea of correlationism and um, the incapacity to overcome the Kantian system and, and somehow have access to uh, the in itself. So you can 
you know, try with the romantic framework and that at best will lead you to some kind of fascism. I think some of my um, recalcitrance or, or kind of uh, not being relaxed completely with the idea of resonance is something that's something to be totally embraced and, and um, probably comes from the false hopes in romanticism or going down a kind of ultimately irrationalist path, uh, path and saying, okay, what is incommensurable and what reason can't do. I'm really very much interested in what reason can do, um, but also in how reason ill-conceived leads to really catastrophic situations like the one we're in now. I think we are in a situation that is effectively um, the unintended consequence of the enlightenment, an idea of reason that despite itself and despite its own better judgment, has um, yeah, enabled us to think in such a way that we can't really deal with the trauma that we unleash through techno-scientific progress. So I'm not uh, against reason, I'm not an irrationalist, I'm not a technophobe, but we have to try and put our finger on what went, what went wrong, why, how do we have this cleavage between um, a super extremely sophisticated state of the arts, um, level of scientific inquiry and technological advances and at the same time a really medieval um, dynamics of psychosocial individuation and actually i should take this right back because i think one of the most interesting times for discussing individuation was the middle ages so i don't know what we are but this is not a good it's not a good moment that we're in and so um what it was I was thinking, okay, there's the various avenues with speculative realism where you can try and recuperate the real. The idea of um, extinction is a horizon that you can't, that isn't really an object for thought, but that shatters the, the illusion of correlationism, or the illusion of a kind of totalizing role of correlationism. There's, uh, I know, Mia Su's approach, which is an extremely formal approach to, to Mm, starting with this idea of the archaeofossil, but it, it also goes somewhere completely different. It has nothing to do with actual geology or even the, the origin of, of the known universe. It's got something more to do with breaking through a formal system in, in this case. Then there was Ian Hamilton Grant to, I mean, anyway, there were ver various ways of looking at this and it, it's followed me for many years that I thought, okay, what, what is it with reality that presents itself as a problem? rather than as an object of thought. And one type of experience that presents itself as a problem for cognition, I felt when I had this experience of Rosacea's performance, was that um, also the a priori of um, space and time are warped or rendered problematical if you have an, a really truly traumatic experience, let's say for example, a real explosion and mediated through the artistic sphere, the way that Rosacea did, it's obviously not trauma in the same sense that you would have you know, post-traumatic stress from it, but I, I just have been wondering for a long time and what, to what extent can thinking about trauma open up an avenue to staying within the ambitions of the critic of pure reason. And so a speculative thought that can go beyond um, experience, but at the same time is somehow not the same as, um, I'm sorry, I'm like, I'm going, it's probably because you you really hit a nerve. I'm, I'm, it's kind of clear in my mind, but it's, uh, I don't know how to say it in a, in a short way. I thought that perhaps the real can not only be part of philosophy and of reason, but is its raison d'etre, it's the reason why we philosophize. At the same time, it is true that as soon as you talk about it as an object of thought, it is something that is, is caught up in our a priori and in the conditions of rational thought. So in, it's only, there is a level of experience that presents itself as a problem rather than as an object of thought. This transition from problem to something that you can objectify I think this is where thinking about noise, both metaphorically and um, looking at the practices around noise in, in sound, in art, uh, is really interesting. And I, I had a real moment of tenderness for the 
um, the ambition of failure of the moment of noise, the fact that it cannot get over, it cannot fulfill its promise, if you like, of an objectless experience. It becomes, I mean, this is, this, this is the paradox of noise, um, like every other form of innovation becoming something recognizable. And then where is the noise? This is what Martin works on now, I think. And he's also doing really interesting work. But even though, like everything else, falls into this dialectic of an experience that becomes an object of experience, there was something so ambitious in noise that I can't compare with any other practice. I think it was a real high point in the, in the development of aesthetics to the utmost limit of what is the aesthetics is, to the utmost limit of what art is. Also with the accepting that this may no longer be music, may no longer be art. So what is it in that moment? It's something that's captured again but there was a moment of suspension like that of asking itself a very radical question, posing a problem, I think, that I, I think I'm really fond of. That wasn't a, a straightforward answer. I think I was just rambling about, was it? I don't know. No, that was great, thank you. I guess you could say, uh, in a nutshell, what's the difference between an object for thought and a problem for thought? I will make a general question. Question, perhaps. Um, I was I was think, thinking about this this at the the beginning of your book, epistemology of noise, where uh, one can read that. Uh, in the preface of it, clearly the noise is a, a vari variable within the process of reason of thought, and in this in this sense, uh, where one can uh, where can we situate resonance in this at this point, because noise also resonates, and so resonance is a, a subcategorization or is a categorization that can incorporate noise as, as this variable in this process. I don't know if, if it's clearly. No, it was clear, but can you say it again just so that I can um, jump off from it? I did. I think it was very clear, but do you mind saying it just one more time so that I, I have time to... Um... I, was, I, was wonder, I was wondering that this, because I was, I was thinking, uh, I also wrote in, in the paper and in, in my notebook that like a, a, linear, a linear thing, like noise, uh, an arrow and reason and this arrow like being uh, resonance but I, but I, I was wondering if resonance is not also if resonance also encap encapsulates noise and yes for sure and this is where I think the limitation of uh, resonance as a metaphor is because as a metaphor resonance um, brings us back to a Pythagorean world of order everything is order. And if you figure out the resonance, you figured out the order of the universe, pretty much, and a harmonious order. And this, the interesting thing with noise is that it's the order or it's patterns that we deem not worthy of attention or that have to be excluded for whatever reason. So if you look at the question of patterns in terms of emergence of patterns, then yeah, noise is, for what are dominant patterns? What are peripheral patterns, what, what about the transitoriness of patterns that, or the way that they clash? I mean, noise is absolutely everywhere, but what I think there is a, a um, it's about order ultimately. It, it's about what, what if resonance is a, is a metaphor that is no longer timely because it is stuck in a, metaph in a metaphysics and in a prototype of science that is not adequate to our own times, then we import with it values that do not no longer belong to our time. If you were to import the values of a harmony of the spheres into the complex world and the complex knowledge that we have now, I think you would have a kind of fascist effect. Because what is it that you have to exclude for this order to be harmonious and for everything else to be excluded? And it seems to me that one, one of the 
impasses in which we are now is that we really struggle to deal with complexity because we would like things to be simple and ordered in a way that it might have looked to the Pythagoreans, but it can no longer be like this for us. So noise in the process of cognition, yeah, it's another level of, of um, difficulty. I think it's, a, it's probably something that um, Sonia could talk more about. She recently wrote a really very brilliant paper that I'm hoping will be coming out very soon. Um, and so it's, I think it's to do also with pattern formation with the uncertainty and, and ambiguity that's involved in the process of identifying patterns and, and giving relevance and pertinence to certain patterns and not to others. Did, can you riff off this, Sonia? I, I would love to, but I think uh, there is a few questions lined up, it's better. Oh yeah, I see now there's a few hands up. Go for it, no? Who, who's a page? Can you see you? Yeah, if um, either of you, uh, Jeanette or um, Ms. Lop, whoever wants to go first, you both have your hands up. Yeah, go ahead, Ms. Lop, you go first. Uh, I'm going first, yes? Oh, okay, yeah. thanks. <laughs> uh, a small uh, question concerning <clears throat> uh, almost Pythagoreans, but uh, Leibniz ontology. Uh, his idea of pre-established harmony. Uh, can we call Leibniz uh, ontology resonance or is it a consonance which Hartmut Rosa has written as a totalitarian tendency like meta narrative? So, uh, I mean, uh, monodology work of Leibniz on ontology is rather complicated. Uh, so it's not simplified uh, or something like that, but the idea of pre-established harmony um, at the same time seems to be either uh, resonance or consonance. Uh, what do you think about um, his um, ontology? About, about Leibniz, you mean? Yes. Uh, it, would probably take me, it would probably take me five years of studying Leibniz properly to answer well. I, I can't. Uh, jump on it right now because I think that similarly to Simon Don, it's um, you can have a tendency but if a thinker is really very deep uh, you have often contrary tendencies in someone's thought so I would imagine that yeah as also Leibniz belongs to the same period of axiomatic thinking that um, of Descartes and, um, and Spinoza the question is always, is there, an, is there an emergency escape in a system like that or not? And this requires a bit um, deeper engagement and thought that I can't really... It considers uh, everything in a way of uh, classic determinism, so I think there is no freedom in his, in his uh, worldview. Uh, I know, I, I, I would, uh, it would be tempting to go that way, but I have a really dark memory of the question of the necessity of contingency in in Leibniz, which I can't retrieve because also I haven't really studied Leibniz in depth, but I have a suspicion that if you do, um, also the way that Serre, for example, works on Leibniz, Serre would have not worked. I think some of his most, more interesting work is on Leibniz more than on the idea of noise, for instance, Michel Serre. I would imagine that, um, yeah, it's probably more complicated than that. But in, yeah, in theory, the question is always when you have a closed, system of thought, is it really closed or is there an emergency exit somewhere? And for this, you need to know someone's thought quite well. Or like with Hegel, for instance, it does the thought look like it's open when in reality, perhaps it's really closed. It's, sometimes you can look also, rather than looking at the philosopher himself, you can look at the lineage that follows what, what is the likely impulse or inclination that someone's thought gives to put the posterity of thought. The people who read Leibniz now, are they people who are more likely to engage in systems of thought that tend towards closure or that try to theorize a, a kind of axiomatic closure or are they thinkers that, are, you know? The most part of contemporary works on Leibniz that I have read uh, were concerned with the small problems of formal logic and so on, Leibniz's law, the law of identity. 
so uh, none of them were uh, metaphysical. None of them were deep enough to undercover that question concerning his, his ontology. Yeah, that's sometimes the problem with the way that we do philosophy now when it's a practice, a historiographic practice that is one of exegesis and you know, nailing down the nuance of, which is a really important work that needs to be done, but I don't know. I would be, I think he must have been a fascinating thinker. I, Leibniz. I, I have a suspicion that it, it looks as if it tends towards a closed and deterministic system when probably there's lots of interesting stuff going on that, that might make him a more adventurous thinker to follow than, for example, Hegel. I don't sense. know. I don't want to be too controversial. I, have, I just sometimes feel with Hegel that it's the opposite. That he looks like a system that keeps, that has an inbuilt clause that can never be closed because then you have contradiction and it opens again. Opens again. But I have a feeling that it's um, actually a very closed type of thought. Probably. I don't know, you didn't ask about Hegel. I, I just think I can't give a knowledgeable answer about Leibniz, but I, I would be optimistic that you can go a long way with Leibniz before feeling claustrophobic. Thank you. Jeanette? Yeah, I have more of a comment than a question. Um, because I actually thought that it was interesting that the first question by Patrick um, was about how you related this mythological um, transformation um, with this noise performance that you witnessed. And I connected, like, I, I think it was actually interesting that you, uh, like your way of answering really, resonated with me because often my thoughts are not very straightforward and it needs to yeah I don't know I'm talking from like a perspective of neurodivergence like uh, often uh, uh, yeah like thoughts need to go a certain way and you can't really find a pattern in it anymore so that another one emerges and um um that's also why I'm interested in noise and like performing noise because I feel like it's like an, it needs improvisation, but also like trusting my way of computing input. I don't know. Um, and often, like one note that I that I took down in my notebook now was like uh, the totalitarian tendency of linearity. So that actual for me like but this is a personal thing, like linear thinking actually feels oppressive. And I also thought it was interesting that you mentioned like fascism emerging if we stick to, to um, yeah, like close those straightforward um, um, phrases or thinking. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that, that I found this really interesting. Uh, thanks. I I actually, yeah, now that you say it, probably you could say that what one of my obsessions is um, to uh, to is the unintended consequences of good intentions. I think that it's not awful people who become fascists. I think it's it's a form of um, anxious and compulsive harmony. Is the idea that you you have to strictly exclude anything that messes with your system so that you can have a world that makes sense and um yeah i i i relate what you just said to the film that we watched in the other seminar the act of killing because the um i just i i watched it twice now because i couldn't i still can't understand how people can talk about murdering others in such a um light-hearted way like but of course it's because they don't have they don't they didn't see it as malintended they actually wanted to produce harmony in their society mm -hmm. yeah and you could i mean in that case that film in particular I, I i find it endlessly fascinating because it doesn't leave you in peace you as a viewer you are um, sitting on the edge of your seat and you're not quite sure where you belong on this what your ethical or moral 
right is to watch something like this from what position you could judge or or see something like this without judging and just to come back to the question that she was asked by a, a potential producer so how do we know who the bad guys are um there's this aspect of because it's so obviously screwed up and they know it themselves but the power of narratives that harmonize experience he starts by talking about hollywood films and being the gangster and being the free man and the way that they try to make their own film that would be a narrative that uh, i suppose introduces a form of denial denial of noise denial of what doesn't fit the picture so that then you have a society that makes sense but at what costs And I, yeah, I guess the thing that I was already obsessed with in the epistemology of noise is the fact that um, this anxiety to produce an authoritarian type of order, resonance, regularity, control is something I think that is co-produced by the desire for novelty. So the more we are innovative, the greater the risks we take, the more change there is, the more at the same time grows this anxiety and the need to, um, to recuperate, to create a um, compensatory form of simplicity, regularity, order. Rather than seeing it as an opposition between the people, I don't know, who are um, in the right and those who are in the wrong, the people who have the right kinds of values and the people who have the wrong kinds of values. I think it's it's a mechanism that is imbricated. The same type of phenomenon produces both. So if you have, for example, a very, um, uh, someone said to me recently, you're only ever truly free in an authoritarian state because when you're free there, you know you're truly free said if you live in a liberal state you have the illusion of freedom when actually you're always being you know coerced and controlled in ways that you can't even identify properly anymore so i think that both oppressive authoritarian states um, increase the possibility of, of a form of radical freedom as a kind of counter reaction and likewise um, situations that appear to be fostering innovation and freedom and openness and and the kind of capacity to embrace uncertainty at the same time in an unwitting way introduce mechanisms of uh, reduction sim simplification and i guess then of oppression and authoritarian tendencies i can't really put i mean i'm not a political theorist but i'm like everybody else i'm perplexed about the return of anachronistic types of um, authoritarian politics everywhere in the world. It's, it's kind of, I'm wondering why, why is this happening right now? Everybody's asking themselves this question. Eduardo, did you want to expand on your comment at all? So, so who just said this? Oh, I was just asking if Eduardo would want to expand on I, the comment in the chat at all. Oh, I didn't see the comments in the chat. Eduardo, can you hear us? Yes, yes. Um, I wanted to ask you, Cecil, uh, and everybody else as well, uh, what do you think, since we were talking about Kant, and like these limitations and approaches to reason, uh, if you're familiarized or what you think about uh, the critique of uh, Somhete, which is specifically an epistemologic <clears throat> critique, of the idea of bourgeois science. And he goes as far to say that like Kant can only arrive to the idea of the transcendental subject because of the abstraction of the money. So in, in a certain sense, 
Song Hato places, places the commodity as something that like um, bootstraps capitalism is starting on ancient Greece and he makes like a whole short summary. But um, his idea is that both Galileo and Kant, uh, even though they don't aren't perceiving it, they are working with abstract categories because they are being conditioned by the act of exchange and the uh, rise in capitalism. And I was interested in what you, what you think of this. It's interesting that you mentioned this um, because Martin also mentioned Son uh, in a really interesting way. And when Martin did a workshop recently, so for those of you who don't, is there anyone who doesn't know Martin's work? He's going to in, in get involved also. I think most people probably do. He also got involved with the new center before. Um, he did a workshop at a um, place called Cafe Otto in London. And during this workshop, one of the questions that came up for me is whether it is not capitalism that leads to abstraction, but whether perhaps on the contrary, it is the process of abstraction in Western philosophy that leads to capitalism. Is that an, is that an okay answer? Yes, yes. And this is in a way one of the reasons why I kept repeating this, the way that Brassier formulated this um, Adornian and Horkheimian uh, critique, the subsumption of the particular under the universal, because fundamentally this is, this is the problem that we inherit from Parmenides. Other stuff happens at the same time as Bar Parmenides too, but there's this moment of capture and subsumption, the idea that you need, that everything that happens have to be, has to be translated into universal terms, into the realm of what Whitehead would call eternal objects. And so I'm, I'm, I was just wondering whether this voraciousness of ideas that progressively hoovers up all of the complexity and singularity of the world of, of the um, realm of experience, whether this in itself is something that is um, that leads necessarily to capitalism. Maybe this is the problem of capitalism is that we are already before the economic blueprint of capitalism arises, we are already in a, in a machine that hoovers up the singularity of experience and spits out universals or um, transposable ideas. In a way, this is why I'm so interested in the problem of individuation, which is not the same as ontogenesis. Simon Don talks a lot about ontogenesis and the idea of individuation as and what strikes me throughout the centuries was to understand what is singular about experience. What is this thing that is a here now in such a way that something else might be identical to it, but it's not it. We have only this singular individual, whichever one it could be that you, you'd say that the cosmos is an individual or that a stone or a grain of sand is an individual or the human being that it doesn't matter what kind of um, empirical reality you, you attribute this to. For me, it's the problem of the non-transferable singularity of something that presents itself in, in experience. That could be also just the experience of thought. It doesn't have to be in, um, in real. So yeah, was, what do you think, Eduardo? Whether you could speaking. turn around the question of Son Riddle and say, rather than saying capitalism leads to abstractions, we could ask ourselves whether there is a mechanism, an amplif amplificatory mechanism of abstraction that starts with Western philosophy. And that is perhaps the true singularity of what is Western about philosophy, because it always really rubs me up the wrong way to think of philosophy as, as a practice that would be specifically Western. But it does seem to be, there, there is something about the um, infernal mechanism of this hoovering up this abstraction that hoovers up the singularity of lived experience. Yes, yes, I agree. I, I was wondering if it is in a case where we have like maybe a bad use of abstraction. I don't know if, if we can get rid of abstraction in the same sense that I don't know if we can get completely rid of alienation. Uh, I think like the xenofeminists make a strong argument for alienation and abstraction. Um, but maybe we have like 
bad uses of uh, abstraction and the ones that want to subsume everything into universals and I, I wouldn't know how to think of it in a different way, but I think like maybe some headers uh, helps us to envision how there's like uh, how these imperatives are at work when we are thinking of science as well. That science is like isn't this neutral neutral field, but it's like uh, uh, in an, a change with the material and philosophical conditions as well. It is something that it's being affected by ideas in ways which are hard to quantify and even measure. And if we think of this as bourgeois science, like what what would be another form of science? I wouldn't know how to answer that. Maybe Whitehead could help us. And then I think that you have more to talk about him than me, Cecile. Well, I, I have not, I'm glad that you mentioned Whitehead because I think that he introduces something um, really spectacular, which is this problem of concretion for which he uses the concept of God, which he didn't have to, because he was so, so careful not to call his eternal objects uh, universals, but he does call the principle of concretion God. And so this moment of, what does he call it? Um, um, the ingress of eternal objects in actual occasions. And he, he, this moment of concretion, the singularity that no longer is reducible to, to the particular constellation of eternal objects that it, um, that it needs to articulate itself. I, I haven't come across anything like this in any other philosopher. And it's interesting that it comes from a mathematician. So I, I would say, yes, it's possible. It has to be possible. If we want to think of what is powerful about this amplificatory mechanism of abstraction that allows us also to have this tremendous scientific and um, technological progress, I think it is possible to think about it differently but there's an element missing. And with this element missing, this amplificatory process of abstraction is a form of madness. One that alienates us so completely that we are in the process practically of destroying our, you know, the conditions of possibility of uh, life as we know it on earth, which might not be the end of, of humanity, but certainly we could reach a point of no return that is totally unnecessary on the grounds of, it's a form of madness inside the process of, of abstraction in which we are. So that it's of the utmost importance not to think outside of abstraction as if we didn't need rationality in science because all you find without completely outside of rationality in science, what do you find? You find dogmatism and a, a, randomness, as, a randomness of thoughts that impose themselves as authoritative. So we need to understand and I think I really hope He's certainly not the only one, it's not the biggest answer, but I, I, it seems to me that the attempt that Whitehead makes to truly think the ingress of abstraction, or the abstraction is not the right word, the world of this full sweep of eternal objects in the actual occasions, and yet grant the actual occasion the singularity of something that is truly individual. I don't know if I'm projecting this on Whitehead or if he hasn't said it, then maybe that's the argument I need to strive to make in the future. But yeah, that seems to me really crucial to figure this out right now. You could even say that this moment of concretion, the individual, forget when you say individual, the idea of uh, the person in front of you think of individual as whatever it is that presents itself in the here now in such a way that it, ha that it has the consistency of an experience. If, like the medieval thought, the individual is, is something that cannot be reduced to all of the things that can be said of it by way of universals. So all the things you can say about a universal are things that you can say, sorry, all the, yes, all the things you can say about an individual that are universals are things that you can say about other individuals too. And the only thing you can say about an individual that is only true of this individual, and that's what they used to call the principle of individuation, is a concept that no longer has a content. Or it has as a content only this singularity, but not properties that you could attribute to other things too. 
So this form of the singularity of a limit concept that is no longer, that can no longer find its place other than as a singularity in this hierarchy of, of abstract notions. The moment of ingression when the eternal objects are part of the articulation of the of con the concretion and I don't know does that I'm sorry I'm completely improvising here and this might not make any sense at all to introduce these words from Whitehead here. Yeah, no, it, I was thinking about this in terms of noise. What if the principle of individuation, this moment of concretion, something that is the absolute singularity of lived experience that can only be articulated in terms of universals, but that there's nevertheless a here and now so that it cannot be transposed on any other lived experience. What if, Noise was another word for this singularity of the lived experience, for, for a kind of moment of concretion that is an individual, but not in the modern sense of the world of the word. You could say hexaity, like uh, hexaity is a word that means nothing else except the this here-ness, the uniqueness of the this here that cannot be transferred onto any other reality. What, what if noise was perhaps the only suitable concept. I mean, noise obviously has all these, uh, this panoply of other concepts, the, the sound, the moment where we talked about it a moment ago with this moment in the history of, of music and sound that the moment you familiarize yourself with it, you have a catalog of sounds that you call noise. But there is also something extraordinary that happened with noise. I, I guess maybe Maybe it's already too problematical to use the concept of noise, but certainly in what I'm after, there is something in the idea of noise that coincides with this um, problem of individuation as something that is a limit concept that cannot be, of which you cannot say things that are true for anything else. Or, which, or, or rather you can say a lot of things about the moment, the concrete moment in the present moment that are true also of other moments, but they are not what captures what is non-transferable about the here and now of lived experience. It's uh, so weird to speculate like this in front of a screen when you can't see half the people, I don't know. Maybe we need alcohol for this to make sense. Um, we're actually going to be wrapping up in a few minutes as well. Um, and I wanted to just talk about presentations. If um, you wanted to say any like closing thoughts or if anyone had any last comments or questions before we close out. I just wanted to add really quickly, it's making total sense, don't worry. <laughs> but also that, yeah, I was, that's why I mentioned earlier, like one of my interests is the, the concept of pointing or the act of pointing because it has precisely also that, I think. And it's like, as you know, if we are trapped in this attention-based linguistic intrasubjective system that we, this is, you know, what, what leads to the trap of abstractions, but also to the openness of abstractions. But, but yeah, noise does that for me as well, which, which pointing does. You're always doing that novel thing of calling someone else's attention to something there. And it's also this sort of genetic originary moment of that's what communication is. You're trying to say that you're noticing something and someone else can notice this too. Uh, and you assume that they can notice it. So you point to something uh, and not only humans can do it, right? Also other beings can do this too. But, uh, but I was thinking precisely of this and that's, that's the sort of almost originary abstraction, right? Just the act of it's going outside of yourself and you're doing something with time that is not uh, of, um, yeah, um, yeah, no. That's it. <laughs> but thank you. That was really, really wonderful. Yeah, thanks. This just opened up a whole a whole other avenue for, for dialogue, for discussing. We have to come back to. I wanted to say something very, very quick because uh, I would again support what Sonia said, that it makes total sense. 
And since we, um, I can't help but, but think about something that has come to my mind when, when talking about white hat, that for me, there's a, an evident uh, link to codependence uh, between objects and occasions or their realization for their actual ingression, that it's something that I don't know why I cannot help but look at it. But what, what I mean by codependence is that each um, uniqueness or, or the, each moment or each occasion to be for it to be unique, it has to depend to others for it to be legible. And I don't know what exactly resonates or links that with this idea of noise as the only suitable concept. Uh, and the last trace I don't remember still, sorry, but I find very interesting and important to, to think about this uh, codependence for for legibility, but also codependence for transformation for the ingression of our applications. Yeah, that's so important. Yeah, uh, so that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. That's so important, I think. And in this lies also the importance of um, overcoming the dichotomy that we've inherited a little bit from critical theory, which is a form of reason that would reject the kind of instrumental techno-scientific form of reason. It's something we haven't finished thinking through here. And what I think one of the big reversals that Whitehead brings into the equation is that if you were, for, and I'm, I'm just going to riff off this and improvise here, but if you were to think of the discovery of abstraction, of systematic abstract, uh, abstraction, as one of the peculiarities of what happened in um, pre-Socratic philosophy. What happened at the same time then was a compulsive valorization and devalorization at the same time. What is, once you start abstracting, what has value and what doesn't have value? So if truth lies in the eternal objects, or if you like the universals that, um, the ideas that help us recognize regularities and invariants, so that we are no longer enslaved to fate, like this uh, thing that happens and we, it happens out of the blue and we don't understand anything. So if truth is to be found in the regu regularity ultimately of this mechanism of abstraction, then the phenomenon is something secondary and to be dismissed. And you have, an, you have an, a dichotomy that is introduced here that could very well lend itself then to really um, annihilating forms of abstraction. Because if your abstraction then hoovers up through ever greater, ever more complex cysts and ever more scientific forms of thought, all of empirical reality, so that lived experience in the end, at the end of the day in comparison has no value at all. You could understand how you arrive in the 21st century at a kind of apotheosis of techno-scientific abstraction, ready to completely obliterate the conditions of possibility of lived experience for us at least on earth and certainly already for many other species. So this is the madness that I, I think obsesses me is how is it possible that the, the discovery of this, I think you could call it an axiomatic method as of building resonance, building this resonance system of, axi of, of um, abstractions. One that is that amplifies itself, that can render itself more complex, more all-encompassing, and at the same time, into the cradle of this type of thought was laid a form of dichotomy that devalues what is not this form of abstraction, which is then the singularity of lived experience. You could even find it, I think, something that used to strike me with Badiou was when he was talking about biology. You thought biology is this uh, wild west of empiricism. You think biology is the moment now that is one of the most exciting forefronts of contemporary science. Why, why the need? Is it the kind of 
lineage of the philosophers that he was operating in, that he had inherited already the, the um, devaluation of something that requires the acknowledgement of lived experience alongside a system of abstractions. Um, we actually have to start wrapping up. So we could definitely continue this discussion in the next seminar or in the Discord. We can always um, chat there in between classes as well. Um, and I'll, I'll just mention quickly that we still need to input some of the readings um, that we're going to get from the guest speakers for presentations. And um, so on Monday, I'll send out a spreadsheet where people can sign up for readings to present. Um, and there will be more information on what those readings will be. And I'll include instructions about the presentations as well. So Amazing. If I could just reiterate, if all of you, without feeling too self-critical or, or holding back, just anything you want to chuck in, into, we could make a kind of separate heading for a syllabus that we expand so that if you have references to artists, to writers, to anything that comes up during the conversation, just trust that it will make sense to people who look at it later and, and chuck it in there. It's gonna be a really rich resource. Thanks everyone. Thanks also for your patience because I did not prepare the presentation for today and I kind of jumped in and felt a little nervous about it. So it's really good to see many of you again and, and good to see new faces too. Look forward to hearing more from you next time. Thank you so much, Cecile. Thank you. And everyone else. Go. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. Take care. <laughs> bye.